uh, Aziz Sanjar uh, was born in Turkey in a small town called Savur in 1946, same year as this previous speaker. Uh, he moved to the United States after having been a medical doctor in Turkey. He went to the United States and got his PhD at the University of Texas in Dallas. Uh, and he's now Sarah Gre Graham Keenan Professor of Biochemistry and Biophysics at the University of North Carolina at Chapel Hill. Welcome to the stage, Professor Sanjay. Thank you very much. Um, I'm truly honored to be here, and, and I, I, I'm grateful um, to the Nobel Prize in, in Chemistry Selection Committee for, for recognizing our work on, on mechanism of DNA repair by photolyase and by nuclear excision repair system, which I'll, I'll uh, present here. Um, I think my presentation is much longer than the first two, and um, <laughs> I, I, I do want to ma make a point because uh, I don't want to get in, into a rush in the end. Uh, it is an important point. Uh, Dr. Um, Lindahl mentioned yesterday that um, Science research is not done in vacuum. We, we all built on researcher, uh, research done by our predecessors as, as well as our contemporaries who have contributed in, in significant ways to, um, to, the, uh, to our own research, that, that, uh, to, to my personal research that um, I, I will present here. But, um, I will present um, data on uh, photolyase and excision repair. Uh, these are two DNA repair systems. Uh, and I, I will also uh, present data on, on circadian clock, which, which um, connect these two repair systems. But I, I really want to emphasize the contribution of many scientists in all these areas that have been instrumental in, in accomplishing what we have. And I just did not want to leave it to the very end so that it, it's uh, mentioned in, in a hurry and without uh, proper recognition. So I, I am grateful to um, all these colleagues who all, over the years um, um, have contributed the, the necessary um, both intellectual background and technology, and um, at, um, frequently reagents that, that has enabled us to, to carry our own research. Um, with that said, then, I, I will um, uh, present you um, our work in, in, in this repair field. <clears throat> I will talk about two repair systems, photolyase and nuclear excision repairs, and, and these two repair systems repair uh, DNA damage by ultraviolet light. Ultraviolet light uh, acts on, uh, the ultraviolet light component of sunlight actually acts on two adjacent thymines in DNA and converts them to um, a thymine dimer or cyclobutane primidine dimer, which is mutagenic, carcinogenic, and lethal to the organism. And, and this damage is repaired in, in E. coli by an enzyme called photolyase. And in, in E. coli and humans, 
um, by an enzyme system called nucleate excision repair system, um, as shown and shown here. Um, <coughs> I will conclude my, my talk about um, how our research uh, on photolysis um, led to the discovery of an essential clock protein called cryptochrome that uh, linked these two research subjects, meaning photolysis and nuclear excision repair, to, to one another and therefore completed the, uh, the circle. Um, Photolyase is a, um, what you may call um, a pho photon-powered nanomachine. Nano is, is uh, popular now, everything is nano, and photolyase is a nanomachine that uses photon to repair time in dimer that is induced by ultraviolet light. Photolysis was discovered by my mentor, Stan Rupert, in 1958. Uh, and the discovery of photolysis is, is um, considered the um, landmark discovery that established DNA repair as a scientific research uh, um, topic. Um, Decades before this discovery of, of photolysis by Dr. Rupert, uh, it was known uh, that um, ultraviolet can kill bacterial cells, like shown here, um, um, depending on the dose, with um, great efficiency. And, um, and, and that's, that was uh, repeated many times. But in, in 1949, um, um, Kellner from Brandeis made the uh, interesting observation that if um, bacteria killed by ultraviolet light were exposed to, to blue light, miraculously they were brought back from the dead. And, and that uh, was a miraculous finding, of course, uh, and he had no explanation for it. Um, and. Um, Then Dr. Rupert um, took this issue and um, analyzed it, and uh, what he did was, uh, first, he demonstrated that ultraviolet light kills cells by damaging DNA, and that the, um, there was an enzyme that um, repairs the DNA damage in a light-dependent manner, and that was the reason for resurrecting light, uh, so resurrecting dead bacteria from light. That was, there was no miracle, there was no metaphysics in it, it was simple physics. And, and the uh, reaction mechanism that Dr. Rupert came up with is summarized here. Ultraviolet converts to adjacent thymines to time in dimer, and there is an enzyme called photolysis, which uh, uses blue light energy to break these um, uh, abnormal bonds, bonds and convert the time in dimer to, to normal bases, and therefore um, um, repair DNA and eliminate the um, uh, harmful effect of, of ultraviolet light. Now, um, while this, this was uh, a satisfactory explanation, it raised a physical problem. Photolyse is an enzyme, uh, it's protein. Proteins do not absorb blue light. And, and therefore, for the next um, two decades, uh, Rupert and many other scientists um, uh, tried to identify the blue light absorbing component in, in, in photolyse and they were unsuccessful because Dr. Rupert had determined that an, uh, um, an E. coli cell contains only about 10 to 20 molecules of, of enzyme, and this proved impossible to purify. So in 1974, when I joined Dr. Rupert's lab, the, um, 
Jim Cornyn had just been developed at Stanford, and as a, a fresh graduate student, I, I thought I could do anything I wanted, and I proposed to Dr. Rupert to clone the photolyzed gene and overproduce it and purify it, and he said, go ahead, and I, cl uh, and I cloned the I, I, I cloned the gene, uh, and this is the plasmid with the photolyzed gene on it. And in, in the subsequent years at the University of North Carolina, my colleagues and I purified this photolyzed protein in, in gram quantities, and while we purified it, we found that it has um, a bright blue color, and right there, that finding without any analytical chemistry answered the question of what was it in photolyzed that absorbed uh, light and, and catalyzed reaction. It had a blue color, meaning it, it absorbs light. Nevertheless, we had to identify what the material was that, that absorbed blue color, and we carried out uh, analytical chemistry. Uh, um, uh, analysis on the enzyme, and to our surprise, we found that it contained not one, but two cofactors, one flavin adenine dinucleotide and the other folate, and that the enzyme actually could um, uh, um, uh, uh, exhibit colors ranging from purple all the way to, uh, to orange, depending on the various redox status of the flavin cofactor. In, in any event, the enzyme contains two cofactors, one is folate and one is uh, 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 flavin. And our next um, uh, task was then to, to determine the function of these two cofactors. By carrying photochemical experiment, we found that folate actually acts as, as a solar panel. It absorbs light, and just like solar panel, it transfers the energy to the flavin, and the flavin is the catalyst that uh, carries out the catal catalytic reaction to split the primidine, di primidine dimer. Um, to provide structural basis for, for, for this photochemical um, data, we collaborated with Hans Leisenhofer to um, uh, obtain uh, crystallized photolyze and obtain a, th uh, a, a three-dimensional structure, which is shown here in ribbon diagram and um, a surface um, chart um, um, re representation. And uh, like I said, for it, is really um, a solar receptor, sits on the roof of the protein, gathers blue light energy, and transfers the energy to the flavin in the core of the protein to carry out catalysis. Um, with, with this general uh, structural view, then the um, mechanism for photolyze uh, was developed as, as, as shown here. Uh, um, uh, the um, enzyme binds to um, that DNA containing uh, thymine dimer because thymine dimer causes um, uh, abnormal structure in the backbone and it pulls the thymine dimer w from within the helix into Van der Waals contact with the flavin and it makes a very stable complex. Nothing happens un until uh, a blue light photon is absorbed by the fo folate which transfers the um, excitation energy to flavin, and the flavin repairs the cyclobutane dimer or thymine dimer by a cyclic redox reaction. The dimer is, 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 uh, is uh, repaired, and the enzyme dissociates from DNA and goes on to search for new damaged site and, and to uh, reinitiate the cycle. <coughs> Uh, over the past 10 years, in collaboration with uh, Dongping Zhang from Ohio State University, we have 
um, determine the microscopic rate reaction for every single step in, in catalysis from uh, absorbent light, um, energy transfer, and various steps of uh, electron transfer, uh, bond cleavage, uh, bond formation, and back electron transfer. To make a long story short, we have the rate constant at picosecond resolution in real time for the catalytic reaction um, and uh, the entire catalytic cycle takes uh, about 1.2 nanosecond. <coughs> Photolysis, in, in, in addition to in, its intrinsic value, is actually contributed to the other major repair mechanism that, that's found in many organisms, and that is nucleotide excision repair, which is the other topic of, of my research. In, in the early days on, on, um, of work on, on photolysis, the, the, the way the experiment was done, uh, cells would be respanded in, in buffer, and, and they would be irradiated with ultraviolet light, and, and half of the sample would be kept in dark, and the other would be exposed to blue light, and then they would be analyzed for time and dimer content. Of course, the one exposed to blue light, time and dimers would disappear. The one that was in dark, time and dimers repaired in the genome. However, if a, a small change was made in that design, if the buffer contained glucose, it was found that even the ones that were kept in dark uh, lost the dimers from the genome. But there was a difference between the, that loss and the loss that was caused by photolysis. When the cells were kept in dark in the presence of, of glucose, even though the, the dimers were lost from the genomes, they were within the cells. They were gone from the genome, but they were in the cytosol. And that led to the concept of nucleotide excision repair by Howard Flanders at Yale and um, Setlow at Oak Ridge National Laboratory. And that, that will, uh, is the, the next topic that I'll be talking about. So um, after this initial discovery by uh, Setlow and, and Hart Flanders, uh, research was done in, in, in many labs from, from in 1964 till 1982. And, and the basic conclusion from these studies are summarized here. Time and dimers are removed from the genome in both E. coli and humans, and excised time and dimers uh, uh, were found to be in oligonucleotides, four to six nucleotides in length, and uh, it was also found that this uh, repair re reaction is genetically controlled by the EVR genes in E. coli, EVR, A, B, and C, and XP genes in humans, and XP genes, there were seven of them, XPA through XPG, and that the basic reaction mechanism is what we call uh, endonuclease, exonuclease, coupled with repair synthesis. But importantly, the excised dimers remain in the cell as opposed to photoreactivation. So, so this was the, the view in, in 1982. And um, in 1987, um, after my my initial work on photolysis in, in Dr. Rupert's lab, I, I joined uh, um, uh, Dean Rupert's lab at Yale University to study the E. coli nucleotide excision repair. And for that, I cloned the th three genes that were implicated in excision repair, UVRA, UVRB, and UVRC. Nothing was known about, about these genes. Uh, and well, what they did, I developed the maxi cell method for specifically radiolabeling plasmid encoded gene and identified uh, the, these three uh, proteins uh, as 185 um, and uh, 70 kilodalton proteins and then purified them in um, milligram quantities as shown here in a Kumasi blue stain gel. And 
ask the question, how do uh, these proteins carry their uh, re repair reaction? And what I found was, was uh, this, and this was different from the classic endonuclease, exonuclease uh, uh, reaction mechanism in that the three proteins acting together made incisions at precise site seven nucleotides, five prime to damage, and three nucleotides, three prime to damage to release an oligonucleotide of, of uh, um, 12 nucleotides, and then the you know, gap was filled and, um, and, and, and ligated. And having the the basic mechanism um, is established with these three proteins. Then later on um, at the University of North Carolina, um, my, my uh, colleagues and I studied the individual function of these proteins, and we uh, established this reaction mechanism. UVRA recognized damage, recruits UVRB, promoting a very stable um, um, GVRB um, damage DNA complex, which then recruits GVRC, has the tunicleus active site, makes the dual incision, and then GVRC is dis, uh, uh, displaced by, by helicase, GVRB by polymerase, and the gap is filled and ligated. <clears throat> While this work was, was um, um, going on, Phil Hanawalt at Stanford published a paper uh, showing that both in E. coli and in humans, um, transcription strongly stimulated repair. And, and he and others suggested that the reason for this was because the rate limiting step in, 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 in repair is um, the damage recognition step. And, and, and the explanation was that our nepromerase stops at the damage site, cannot pass the damage, and, and it constitutes a, a large target. And as a consequence, it, it is a good target for damage recognition, and that's how it facilitates repair. So we tested this model in a defined system, meaning the EVR ABC and our nepromerase with uh, substrate containing timing dimer, we found that in contrast to, the, to that model, stalled RNA polymerase did not stimulate repair, but actually inhibit it. And therefore, we proposed that there must be a protein that uh, removes stalled RNA polymerase and on top of that, recruits the repair protein to accelerate the repair rate. And we proceeded to purify this protein using biochemical assay. And uh, the rea uh, results are shown here. We purified this protein. We called it transcription repair coupling factor. Turned out that to be a gene that had been identified decades ago uh, with, with regard to mutagenesis study by Evelyn Witkin and was named MFD. In any event, MFD or transcription repair coupling factor indeed recognized stalled RNA polymerase at damage site, displaced it, and while uh, uh, concomitantly re uh, recruiting UVRA to accelerate the repair rate. Um, so I, at this point, we figured that we, we had uh, uh, completed the uh, description of, uh, of um, uh, prokaryotic uh, repair, though in science, never uh, anything completely complete. Uh, but we moved on to study human excision repair. Um, and that is what I will uh, present to you in, in the next few, few slides. In human excision repair, um, um, as, as I mentioned, it was found that like an E. coli, in hum human excision repair basically proceeded by the uh, same mechanism, meaning um, um, a five prime endonuclease recognizing damage to make uh, incision, and then an exonuclease removes the damage in four to six uh, nucleate long oligomers, 
concomitant with 3% to filling the gap. So um, this was the um, uh, our current uh, state of knowledge when, when we started working on, on um, nucleate excision repair. Uh, in HEMIS, I would uh, also point out that in 1968, um, James Cleaver had found that humans defective in nuclear excision repair, or, or rather patients with uh, uh, very light sensitive uh, disease called zero derma pigmentosum were defective in nuclear excision repair, and moreover that there were um, uh, seven genes uh, that were responsible for this disease, meaning mutation in any of these genes could cause um, defect in nucleate excision repair and therefore zero derma pigmentosum. I, um, and I will show you a picture of a patient with zero derma pigmentosum. Some colleagues found the, the picture very disturbing and they advised me not to show it more than five seconds and, and that's what I will uh, do. It is, um, it is very uh, severe disease, uh, patients have 5,000-fold uh, increase in uh, sunlight-induced skin cancer, and I will not keep it more than five seconds. So um, using our, our expertise uh, in working uh, with, with E. coli um, uh, excision repair, uh, we went on to characterize human excision repair. First, uh, from, from the very beginning, we found that the human excision repair just like E. coli excision repair is also carried out by dual incision. But beyond that, it was very different. To begin with, in, uh, in human excision repair, uh, not just three proteins, but in, uh, in fact, 16 proteins and six uh, repair factors uh, shown here were absolutely essential for making the dual incision. And furthermore, these proteins are evolutionarily not related to the excision repair proteins involved in, uh, uh, in prokaryotic repair. Secondly, even though in principle both E. coli and humans carry out dual, uh, excision repair by dual incision, that's where the similarity stops. The dual uh, incision mechanisms are quite different, in, in, whereas in, in, in humans, the uh, incision is seven nucleotides away from the, the damage. In humans, it's 20 to 22 nucleotides, five prime to the damage, and uh, uh, five nucleotides, three prime to, to the thymine dimer, as a consequence, humans re re remove thymine dimers in the form of a 30 nucleotide long oligomer. The, the um, difference does not stop here. Um, the, in actual mechanism also, the, the rec damage recognition and processing, processing is quite different. The damage is recognized by um, this factor, XPR, PXPC, which recruit TF2H. TF2H uh, is, uh, is the helix as ATPs on one, the, the helix, and then recruits the two nucleases, XPG and XPF, which makes the five prime, three prime incision, and then the repair is completed by um, uh, polymerase and, and, li um, and ligase. Um, Now, in, in, in all these um, studies uh, over the years, both us and other groups work on human nucleated excision repair. Uh, uh, this was confirmed by, by many other groups that humans did uh, excise uh, a 30 nucleated uh, uh, long oligomer, but uh, really a, a serious issue remained, and that was uh, many studies prior at, at published that humans excise the oligo in four to six nucleotide long fragments. And here, all these experiments were done in vitro, and we, we identify a 30 nucleotide long fragment in the in vitro experiment. And therefore, there was a discrepancy between in vitro 
and in vivo data. And uh, it took us 21 years to, to resolve this discrepancy. And the, uh, the key uh, was to, we found that the excised oligo, the excised uh, uh, oligonucleotide, the 30 is in a very tight complex with this repair factor called TF2H. Once we found that, then we said we can immunoprecipitate it and measure the actual size. When we did, it indeed turned out to be in vivo also 30 nucleotide, and that discrepancy was because in the um, uh, other in, in vivo experiments, the, the oligo was degraded. In any event, in vivo, the oligonucleotide is, is also 30 um, nucleotide in length. But this also provided us the means of generating a repair map for the entire human genome as shown here. We irradiate cells with UV, photo products are made, and the dual incision release thermometer, and that's in a complex with TF2H, and we um, immunoprecipitate TF2H to isolate both TF2H and, and the uh, oligonucleotide with it, then ex extract the oligonucleotide and sequence it by next generation sequencing to generate sequences from the entire genome. In a typical experiment, we get 20 million sequences. Then we um, blast these 20 million oligos uh, uh, against the human genome to generate uh, an entire map for, for the, uh, repair map for the human genome. And this is, uh, uh, an entire map for the human repair genome uh, for um, uh, uh, a male individual of 20, uh, 22 plus X ply Y chromosome. The uh, black tracks show the uh, um, uh, uh, transcription uh, tracks, and the green are uh, repair tracks uh, for two types of photo products. Of course, th this, this is a screenshot of the entire genome, and you cannot really tell much, much detail of what's going on. I, I will concentrate on one specific chromosome, 17. This is an important chromosome. It contains uh, the P53 gene, which is mutated in about half of human cancer, and that, that will give a better idea of can, kind of information one can get from, from the um, uh, uh, human genome repair map. Um, this is uh, chromosome 17, it's 83 m m uh, megabase, and here we're showing the transcription of plus strand and mi minus strand, and the excision repair, we call it XRC, excision repair, um, map for, for the uh, whole genome, and it is really a map in the true sense of the word, in the geographic sense, meaning it has mountain, it has valleys, and it, it has uh, canyons, meaning high repair, uh, low repair, and no repair at all. But um, importantly, we can ask question at, uh, for any particular position nucleotide or, or dinucleotide, uh, how that place is repaired. And, and, and just to give you an example, of, uh, for um, uh, th this is the location of P53, and the location of uh, P53 um, dinucleotide, which is highly mutated in skin cancers. Um, so at megabase, that's where it is. At Kilobase uh, uh, resolution. This is the P53 transcript map, and this is the P53 repair map. The um, specific um, hot spot for UV in this uh, uh, cancer is this dinucleotide, and here our repair map shows how this dinucleotide, this hot spot, is repaired by cutting uh, 20 nucleotides, 5 prime, 
um, for, uh, four nuclear ties, three prime to, to damage. Of course, this um, much more information can be gathered from this kind of, of, of map for, for UV damage. Most importantly, this method, nuclear excision repair, also repairs of, uh, um, the damage caused by very important anti-cancer drug, cisplatin. And currently, we are generating a, a, a repair map for cisplatin uh, induced DNA damage, and we hope that that might, might have some implication for, uh, for cancer treatment. To summarize, then, nuclear excision repair is initiated by dual incision, both in E. coli and humans, excision uh, genetically controlled by UVR in E. coli, expedients in humans, and excision is not by endonuclease, exonuclease, it is by dual incision, removing 12 nucleotides in E. coli, 13 in humans, as shown here, and following excision, the repair gap is filled and ligated, and by capturing the excised oligomer, we have managed to generate a repair map for the entire human genome. I would like to close my, my, my presentation with um, a few words about um, cryptochrome and how the work on photolyze led to discovery of, of cryptochrome. Now, if, 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 you, if, if, if you notice, in, in discussing uh, photolyze and nuclear excision repair, I refer to both E. coli and human nuclear excision repair, but when I discuss photolyze, I mentioned only E. coli photolyze because humans do not have photolyze. This, this is a fact now, but for about 25 years after the discovery of photolysis, it was not a fact. It was a very controversial subject. Uh, a number of investigators uh, reporting photolysis and others saying no. So in 1993, we decided to resolve this issue and we carried out an extensive study on photolysis in humans and we published a paper categorically stain, stating humans do not have photolysis. And it didn't take long for the Human Genome Project to release their first draft and saying that humans do have a photolysis homologue. And so we, uh, of course, were concerned that we made a major mistake and decided to work on this homologue while doing that uh, we end up discovering a second homologue. All of a sudden, we have not one, but two homologues, and we uh, decided to um, investigate what these proteins do. As you see here, at the primary sequence level, they are very similar to photolysis, and importantly, even at 3D um, 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 structure level, they are very similar photolysis. So um, we went on to purify them and test them for photolysis activity, and we found none. And at that point, we named them cryptochrome, an analogy to uh, blue light photoreceptors of that name in, in, in plants, and uh, tried to see what, what they do. Uh, so they have high homology to photolyze. They are similar to photolyze. They have no photolyze activity. They're probably blue light photoreceptors. And this is what happened after these findings. This finding was made in the spring of 1996. And at the end of uh, spring in May, I made my annual pilgrimage to Turkey to visit my family and thinking about what we were going to do with those findings. And on, on my return trip, I read the flight magazine talking about jet lag. And jet lag and circadian clock and how this could be cured by blue light. And I came back to the lab and I said cryptochromes are circadian clock proteins. 
And we wrote the paper in, at the end of August, and it was published in November. But uh, saying it's is easy, proven uh, takes time. It took us uh, another two years to prove that these were circadian clock proteins. But, but just to, to say a few words about what circadian clock is, circadian clock is just like the clocks that we are familiar with. Um, uh, they, are, they are mechanical clock, electronic clock. Uh, they are based on either me mechanic principles or electronic principle. And the circadian clock has same kind of design, except here the components are molecules. And, and the, their function is to keep time of day, to tell us what, what time of day it is. And that's what the circadian clock does. Uh, circadian clock um, is an innate timekeeping mechanism, molecular mechanism, that maintains daily rhythmicity in biochemical, physiological, and behavioral functions. And this is independent of external stimuli. So, with, with this background then, to test whether the cryptochromes were circadian clock proteins or not, we generated mice with NACAS in cryptochrome 1, cryptochrome 2, and both cryptochrome 1, cryptochrome 2, and analyzed them for behavior. This is called actogram. You really don't need to, to know about the detail of it. We're uh, uh, recording the activity profile of mice that were kept for 28 hours for, for the experiment. For the first week, they were under light dark cycle. The, the, bl the black traces indicate activity, and the white traces, uh, white uh, regions show rest period, and mice are nocturnal. They run during the day, and they rest during, uh, during the night. They rest during the day. And this same for wild type, for cryptochrome 1 mutant, cryptochrome 2 mutant, and double mutant when they are under light dark cycle. However, when you, uh, when you put the animals under dark, dark condition, meaning no external input, then you see the difference. Both cryptochrome 1 and cryptochrome 2, without uh, having to uh, really know much about it, the behavior is quite different. But most importantly, the double uh, knockout mutant has no circadian clock anymore. So, um, so this then established that these proteins are essential for circadian clock. And during, um, while this was working, going on, in, uh, in, in the period of 1996 to 2000, there was a, a great deal of, of progress in the circadian field that led to the establishment of four genes, cryptochrome, period, clock, and BML1, as essential for controlling the circadian clock in, in humans, and this was the model that was de developed. Clock BML are transcriptional factors, uh, uh, activate transcription of cryptochrome and period, and these proteins come back and inhibit their own transcription, re resulting in rise and fall in, of cryptochrome and up, um, period levels with periodicity of 24 hours. In addition, these proteins, meaning this core clock, these core clock proteins, these four proteins, act on, in, in a given tissue, on 30% of other genes to confer this cyclic expression pattern uh, with, with a daily periodicity, and therefore control the um, biological function with daily periodicity. And among this, we found the excision repair protein, XPA, was also controlled by the circadian clock. And therefore, we asked the question whether the whole nucleated excision repair is controlled by circadian clock. This is the circadian clock, and <clears throat> this is the nucleated excision repair. And so we're asking the question if the, this clock controls um, this nucleate excision repair with daily periodicity? And the answer is yes. Um, 
in this panel, you show the expression pattern of um, XPA protein, which is essential for excision repair. Uh, over the course of the day, it's low in, you know, at 9 a.m. It goes up, reaching a maximum at 5 p.m., and um, a, 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 then start going down to a minimum at 5 a.m. That then led to the prediction that mice would be more sensitive to UV light when exposed to uh, at 5 a.m. when repair is low compared to uh, 5 p.m. when repair is high. And we proceeded to do that. Uh, irradiated uh, two groups of mice with ultraviolet light, one group at 5 p.m. when repair is high, one group at 5 a.m. when repair is low. And as you see, the 5 a.m. group at the uh, irradiated at, uh, low repair uh, period, uh, low repair time, had um, four to five uh, fold increase in invasive skin carcinoma compared to the 5 p.m. repair group. So currently we are um, trying to uh, find out or establish whether this periodicity also uh, happens in humans and whether that can be used in, 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 uh, in preventing, um, uh, making public health recommendation to prevent skin cancer and equally important since this repair system works on um, uh, cisplatin-induced DNA damage for, for cancer treatment, whether this periodicity could be used to improve uh, cisplatin um, uh, treatment of, of, um, of cancers. To summarize, um, to conclude, this is really the summary of my uh, 40 years of work on photolysis. 35 years of work on excision repair in E. coli in humans, and over the last 20 years, we have found that the, the photolysis like cryptochrome links these two repair pathways that we have worked, I have worked uh, all my career. Um, this doesn't really do justice to, to my colleagues, the, the acknowledgement that they have, that uh, as a large number of people have contributed to, to, uh, to this work, and they will be properly acknowledged in the Nobel proceedings. And I have been very fortunate to have uh, outstanding mentors, especially Stan Rupert, who has been my role model and who is the person who discovered DNA repair and introduced me to the DNA repair field. And being a Turk, I would also wish to acknowledge uh, Muzaffer Aksoy, my internal medicine professor, who encouraged me to go to the United States and, and do science, and my other m mentors, uh, Rup, uh, Dean Rupp and Paul Hart Flanders, uh, my collaborators among them, Paul Modrich and others. And as I said, science is not done in vacuum. We have benefited greatly from colleagues who simultaneously carry similar work on photolysis, on circadian clock, and on excision repair. And I'm grateful to all of them as well. And I thank you very much for your patience. Now I think we can all sleep well at night, knowing that our molecules do the job for us. Uh, I would now like to welcome all three laureates up to the stage. Keep the sound I guess.